Hello, thank you and welcome to Chain Reaction. I'm Kevin Bridges and today I'm interviewing a man who is a friend of mine. I'm a huge fan of his work. It's Frankie Boyle. Cheers, Kevin. <laughs> Frankie, I've never actually interviewed anybody before. I feel like a HND journalism student <laughs> and I need to do this for my module. <laughs> Ask me anything, Kevin. Ask you anything at all. Um, do you ever listen to the shipping forecast? <laughs> yeah, I always find that sort of sublimely hypnotic. See, I, I bought a boat this year. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I listened to the shipping forecast, try to get into the sort of maritime lifestyle, and uh, it never made any sense. <laughs> but you've, you've been on the boat? I have been on the boat. It was a very yeah. cold day, and uh, you, you drove it like a maniac from Claybank <laughs> around Loch Lomond. Well, what actually happened that day was we were actually mates off stage, <laughs> yeah. Frankie and I. And uh, I'd said to him, Do you fancy going a cycle? Yeah. We'll leave for Glasgow and cycle to Loch Lomond. And uh, Partick is the nearest area of where me and Frankie live. And uh, Partick is where you ditched the idea of yeah. the cycle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I cycled and you get a taxi. I, I made it to Dumbarton Road from my house. And then you said, well, I'll join, I'll join up with you in like 40 minutes up at Barlock. And then you appeared like three hours later, having been stuck in a housing estate. And you were in a, a shop having a rolling egg? I had two lunches. And we, <laughs> and it, was, it was one of the least successful days of exercise of all time. <laughs> but you, you expressed a bit of concern, though. You text me saying, are you all right? Because obviously it was a lot longer yeah. than planned. And I've found that the... I met you when I was maybe 19 in here. Mm -hmm. We were on Shared the Bill together uh, uh, for the first time. And I'm watching your set and I'm just going, that guy must be brutal. <laughs> but you're actually a lovely guy. You've got a, one of my favourite birthday presents of all time is from yourself. You bought me a Skeletric set. <laughs> That's right, yeah, yeah. For your 21st? For my 21st. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've still got it. Alright, does and it I, work? Um, it works, it's still there. I've got it, so maybe we'll hook up for a game and I you can abandon it. <laughs> At the first turn. <laughs> Drop my egg roll on the bend. <laughs> yeah, I, I hang about with you in the streets and I'm thinking maybe you're just going to start laughing at disabled people. <laughs> <in the face. laughs> Walking up and booting guide dogs right in the muzzle. And... You're a good guy. I know. I, I think there's a thing in comedy, isn't there? We're certainly in the last ten years or so. People kind of don't really understand the whole idea of what the persona is you adopt on stage. And what I, I had a review one time, and the guy's going, uh, "I could accept what he's saying if he was a character act." And he's saying, "Well, where's that intellectually? I'd feel better about this if you were wearing a hat." <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really bear up to the examination. Would you, you ever consider take, that? Hmm? Would you ever just, consider just wearing a hat? <laughs> <laughs> hat off. <laughs> It's me. Uh, I think things would be a lot easier. Things are a lot easier if you just go, oh yeah, I'm a pub landlord or a preacher or a whatever. Do you know what I mean? People seem to be able to deal with that a bit better than I'm a comedian. But, you know, that's kind of their problem. When we started, you sort of took me under your wing. Yeah. And I'd always ask you advice. And it got to the stage I thought, I don't know if he's the guy I should ask advice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fan of your work. And I, I checked up on what you're up to today, uh -huh. and you're feuding with X Factor winner James Arthur. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever just wake up in the mood for a nice, quiet day? <laughs> Zero uh, scandal. Just... I think it's partly been retired from the stand up as well, man. The other day, we're driving back from uh, Radio Clyde, and my pal goes, Well, oh, that's where one of the Bible John murders was. <laughs> so I said, Well, let's go up and have a look, right? So we drive up there. And I'm going, oh, this was a long way to come in a taxi for Bible John, right? <laughs> let's, let's drive up to the Barrowlands and see, see what was going So I start theorising, maybe lived out sort of Scottsdale and Clyde Bank way, right? And I said to my pal, I said, we should get a map and put the, the murders on it. And then you do, any point where you, you're starting to get a map and put murder sites on it <laughs> is a point where you need to get a job. Yeah, you've actually got a good backstory before comedy. You worked in a psychiatric hospital. See, that's, that's show business, though, man. We start thinking of backstories rather than lives. <laughs> I've got a great good backstory, you know what I mean? Uh, I worked for a year in a, a mental hospital, and uh, that was a right laugh. Uh, still have a good laugh at that. No, it was, um, it was, it was a really great job, but uh, it was that thing as well where you, sort of, um, you saw the start of this. You know how prevalent kind of TV and fame kind of affects people now? Because, like... 
Uh, in the old days, you ever read about it was like Napoleon uh, was who people thought they were in, a, in an insane asylum. And then it was Hitler. So you see the people I worked with who were like in their 60s, mid-60s, it was always Hitler, Hitler's after me. The Germans are travelling through time and all that stuff, right? It was always about Hitler. And nowadays, it's always about TV. So if you see young people now who are schizophrenic and stuff, it's always like, oh, the TV's telling me to do this, or I'm in this show, or I'm, a, I'm on TV, or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And that's right. what I think is weird about... Uh, Actually, doing TV is, is you actually are doing that. So you're in the uh, you're in the same place as mental illness, essentially. Probably somebody, <laughs> somebody you used to look after who now hangs still Frankie Boyle. <laughs> I might be him. <laughs> it was quite an interesting job though, because it was like you start to wonder about you know where the line is and where we tell people things. You know what I mean? So I had a woman, a client. Who was a, a lovely woman, right? But she she had a real like weight problem, and she was like um, she was a pretty ill person. And uh, part of her care plan was she liked to get up and eat in the night, right? Like in the dead of night, right? So you'd sort of come in when you're doing a sleepover, and you'd find this, you know, pretty heavy woman in a wheelchair, and she'd be like eating a block of cheese out of the <laughs> out of the fridge, right? And you, oh, this is obviously terrible. And we'd sit down and have a meeting about it and that, and then eventually you sort of start thinking. I eat cheese out of the fridge. <laughs> Sometimes in the dead of night, do you know what I mean? So you're definitely retired. You're, that's, you're well, done with stand-up. I'm done with stand-up. I'm sort of moving more into hip-hop now. <laughs> I'm moving on to the kind of London grime scene, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's partly just having little kids as well. You can't really be away. For like, you know, I used to go away for like six months and stuff, and now that they're a wee bit older. How about the kids? They're uh, very jolly, very funny. My daughter's got into uh, Faulty Towers recently, <laughs> uh, and she really, really loves it. But also, there's part of that thing where you start to notice, oh, she's starting to notice I'm a bit like Basil. <laughs> I'm a bit like, I'm a bit like, you know, your kids get to age sort of nine, ten, when they start to go, this guy doesn't really know what he's talking about. <laughs> Out starts to creep in. I'm just, the other one's six. I'm quite enjoying still being, you know, seen as a, a, a figure of authority. And falls funny, your son. Yeah, he started writing jokes, uh, which I find just really distressing. <laughs> There's a, a short story I used to teach when I was an English teacher. What's it called? Exam day, and it's all about a wee boy who's uh, asking his dad questions over breakfast. He's going, "How how near's the sun?" And his dad's a thousand miles away. Shut up. Right. Uh, well, why is grass green? Shut up, son, I've told you before, no questions and all that. And you just think he's a really horrible dad. And then the boy goes off to school or whatever. And then at the end, he gets a phone call from some authority going, yeah, your son scored too high in the IQ test, we've had to kill him. You're going to have to turn up and pick up the body, right? And you realise it's actually set in the future and that the, the dad was actually trying to stop his kid from being too intelligent, do you know what I mean? Because of what he knows. And that that is kind of how I feel every time my son tells me a joke. <laughs> Just, just don't go down that road, Oh, you sound... You can tell you're a good dad, of course. That's, that's what you're looking for. You know. My dad was the exact same. I just think it's great we've put you on near the end of the chain, because there's every chance the series could get pulled. Yeah. Bible John, and now how you don't love your kids. You know, preparing them for the post-apocalypse <laughs> thing. Do you, is that something you think about, like doomsday? Not doomsday. You give that so impression that you think about something oh. horrific is going to happen at any minute. No, it's not just me. It's science. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things there where people are oh, very negative about things like you're like, well, you know, the scientists are saying the world's going to end quite soon. It's not the guys with placards anymore. It's like climate change experts going, uh, you're all going to drown. I was on, uh, I was on Richard and Judy one time, right? And this is the most. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> You might hear the biggest bummer of, of, of a comedy introduction ever, right? There's, there'd been floods in England, right? So they got on to flood experts uh, on Richard and Judy, right? And they're both agreeing with each other, basically. Uh, they're, they're, they're experts in, in uh, climate science. And uh, Richard and Judy are saying, oh, this has been a bit bad. But, and the guy's going, it's beyond a bit bad. You know, Norfolk's going to disappear underwater <laughs> within like 30 years, right? And you can tell Judy's kind of taking this to heart. Oh, my God, right? <laughs> She's just not thought about it, right? And she's just come to for long enough to get worried. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Richard tries to kind of smooth the whole thing over, right? And he goes, uh, yeah, but there's things like the Thames flood barrier, so, you know, there's still stuff we could do. We're not necessarily going to, you know, sink beneath the waves. And he's trying to sort of move on. And just as he does that, the climate change guy goes, yeah, but the Thames flood barrier took 25 years to build. There's no chance. <laughs> <laughs> Richard just turns really smoothly and goes, Anyway, some comedy. <laughs> Do you watch the show, Doomsday Preppers? It's basically guys. I don't mean to be flippant. I know there's something horrific that's going to happen if we don't up our game. But I just don't think about it every day because I'll be gone. I know that sounds selfish, but oh, the life expectancy in Scotland is not great. I d- <laughs> To buy, I, I was in a shop East End of Glasgow I had to buy a 70th birthday card and the guy just looked at me <laughs> we can do your 40 and a 30 mate but <laughs> we don't stop so. it it's basically guys that have just got um, they've got huts and they've got loads of tinned food and just basically stocking up for the yeah. day it's game over the yeah. world gets control alt deleted and it's <laughs> You can't help but think these guys are just nutters. Yeah. But you're making a valid point. I put my blue bin out and my green bin and that sort of stuff. <laughs> I take precautions. Well, there's that, there's that side to it as well, isn't there? Where you sort of ever worried you get about it, you go, it's probably not going to help me cleaning out my jam jars. <laughs> probably not going to avoid species extinction. So you don't miss the stand up? At all. You've no, I mean, because it's kind of, when I get into comedies, like, when I started, it was kind of the sort of job you did because it didn't have any consequences. And so some of the people I used to work with, they were sort of people who robbed a post office or something, <laughs> you know? And, and instead, they got into this because you didn't have to sort of turn up on time or, you know? And it, and it didn't really matter what you did. And now that, the, now everything seems to be observed and then, then said to other people who, who don't like it. And to me, that's a strange thing. I had a thing that was like, but remember the guy that did the speaking clock? The, the guy that did the speaking clock had just died that week and I went, uh, hopefully died on the third stroke. <laughs> right. and my agent got an email from a journalist, right? And this journalist at a broadsheet goes, uh, Mr. Uh, so-and-so did in fact die from a series of small strokes. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to get in touch with his family. Do you want to pass along your apologies for this terrible joke? And I'm thinking, I've not told his family the joke. You're telling his family the joke. (laughs) And there's a concept that is called author by relocation, right? Now, the idea is that, you know, if if I screened a porn movie onto the wall of a local primary school, (laughs) they wouldn't go and arrest Ron Jeremy for it, right? (laughs) Someone else has told the thing. And for me, that happens... You know, the papers are telling these jokes to, to the only people that won't laugh, you know. <laughs> We're not in the front of the door. This is terrible. Well, you, to you it is, you know. It's probably the first time anybody's opened up a sentence with a fast green the palm movie. <laughs> like the side of a local primary school. Let's hope so. So, I've actually took a year out as well this year and we've been, mm-hmm. we've been hanging out and stuff. And I just get this overwhelming boredom. Yeah. That's why I'll always go back to the stand-up. I'm filling my days. I don't have kids, so yeah. I'm trying to fill the... I think I've discovered about 20 new things that I'm not very good at. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing badminton. I go to boxing training, a Spanish class, just chasing some void. Exactly. <laughs> Once you feel that sort of void, that's when you start writing again. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, I've got the kids, so they kind of fill that void with screaming. Um, <laughs> So I kind of feel alright about that, do you know what I mean? It takes about a day for their voices to stop echoing around my head <laughs> for me to get bored. See, I've, just, I've got daytime TV, that's what I've got as an alternative to kids. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to hang a free Parker pen just for inquiring is a good deal. <laughs> that's how much. That's the rut I've slipped into. No, I'm coming across as I'm about to blow my brains out here. I'm a happy guy. <laughs> I've just talked to you for five minutes, you're like this cheerful comedian and now you're suicidal, man. <laughs> you talked about the TV shows. Did you enjoy Mock the Week and the panel shows? Did you? No, I totally hated doing just, that. I don't know any comedian that, <laughs> that enjoys being on a panel show. No, there's a real thing about, on, particularly on panel shows, where you're kind of been told what to talk about. And, you know, you would just desperately try and convince them. The sort of things that a kind of 55-year-old exec producer is going to think would be hilarious. Do you know what I mean? He's like, oh, Andy Murray's falling over at the tennis or something like that, right? <laughs> and you're going, 
trust me, mate, it's rubbish. Like, <laughs> let's try and talk about it. So try, you try to get them to talk about kind of more relevant stuff. But it's partly that thing of you're just going mad, Try to do five minutes that week on it was raining at the golf, you're eventually just going to go absolutely mental. <laughs> and, you know, you, and partly you're trying to collapse those discussions as well because you've got something more interesting. You know, so they'd have an interesting story, maybe right at the end we'll talk about the war or something, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you're trying to get there, so occasionally you just come in and try and collapse the scrum. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but everyone, everyone was great. For all the tension on those things, I always got on with everybody really well and never fell out with anyone. And, do you know what I mean? For all the kind of artificial tension that you think, oh, do those people get on? I mean, everyone was always great. But part of it, it's just the nature of, of a lot of things now. It's a kind of magazine culture where people go, you know, if you see someone doing a show where they visit China, they didn't even want to visit China. Because at the point where they're famous enough... To, to get that show where they visit China, they live in a golden house and they've got like the, the, the talking robot off Rocky 3 and <laughs> like, they're getting dragged away to China. You know what I mean? What made Mock the Week exciting was, to use a football analogy, it was like they would have the subject of the week's news, playing about a patient build up play, and then you would just come in with this horrific <laughs> stud showing <laughs> two foot. <laughs> Face high to challenge, to, and, and it was it was hilarious to, yeah. to yeah. see the, rea the reactions mainly. <laughs> I used to quite enjoy the reactions as well. Do you see yourself going back on TV in any way? <laughs> I don't think anybody does. Thursday <laughs> <laughs> preppers, yeah, yeah. You're a football fan. Aye, aye. You're a Celtic fan. Yeah. Feel the tension. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I've still got that thing, i kind of torn between the fact, you know what, I kind of love supporting Celtic and I love the, the whole kind of thing, and at the same time finding football a bit sort of unconsciously gay. <laughs> do you know what I mean? There's, I'm all for consciously gay, do you know what I mean? I love Oscar Wilde. All the stuff I loved growing up was gay, you know, it was Joe Orton, it was all that kind of stuff. But that whole thing in the west of Scotland where it's a whole load of middle-aged men fretting about a young guy's groin injury, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then all just getting in their tight shorts and huddling in the, you know, I just I thought, this is weird. And also, there's a slight extent, right, this is what I feel about football a bit. I think it's maybe something we created to sort of celebrate the worst in ourselves. Do you know what I mean? Footballers are in many ways the worst humans. And so you look at... Say you look at Star Trek, right? Star Trek is a kind of thing where we say, what would happen if we let our stupid, impulsive side, Kirk, override our rational side, Spock, right? And it's kind of a rational thing, Star Trek, going, what about that, right? And in a way, I think football's a bit like that. It's going, what would life be like if you just never read a book and you just practised running and lifting weights in your thighs? And... <laughs> you know, you look at a dog sometimes, you, you envy a dog, you look into its eyes and you go, I quite envy that dog, you know, because all it's got to think about is eating and when it's going to get out for a run. It wouldn't be that different if you looked in Scott Brown's eyes. <laughs> This would be great on TalkSport just to finish that way. Thanks for your call there. Well, <laughs> that was Frankie next on the line. It's but Denise from Canvas Line. Yeah. That's the other thing, right, is you can't be a normal human on a, a talk sport thing, right? You know, Radio Clyde always has that bammy phone in, right? So, when Henrik Larsson was playing for Celtic, right, they have something about was Larsson the same player after he broke his leg? And people are phoning in and going mental about it on various levels, right? And a guy phones in and goes, well, excuse me, gents, but every cell in Larsson's body will have been replaced since his leg breaks, so he's quite literally a different person, right? <laughs> This guy trying to take it down to sort of Descartes sort of uh, <laughs> rationalism, do you know what I mean? It's just, they just absolutely explode in rage and cut him off. And I think it's the only interesting thing that's been said about it. So you don't bother with the games anymore, I'm guessing, then? You just... No, I went with you to a away game at Falkirk. That's but, right. Uh, it seemed pretty harsh to me. There was a lot of family people in the Falkirk end who you described as getting a crash course in Irish history. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is. It's educational, Scottish football. You've got the history lesson, and now you've got the, the economics with the Rangers crisis. <laughs> it's Celtic fans that know. I think every single Celtic fan could enter a business administration course at HNC level. <laughs> but they know about employee benefit trusts and 
every taxi driver. It's a company volunteer arrangement, mate. That's. That does no shot right, pal. You ever, you ever do jokes about football in your stand-up? I do, yeah. I used to have the odd one or two, but I actually found it would light things up so much. Do you know what I mean? I used to have a thing about, like, you remember we had the Nazi Pope? Uh, I was going to, it's a pretty confusing time for far-right Rangers fans, right? And, but so I find if you had anything else of interest to say, people, Scottish people are so interested in that that they're like, wait a minute, mate, get back to the sectarianism. Do you know what I mean? You couldn't really go anywhere. You're quite a political guy. Mm-hmm. On Twitter and in your interviews, and I've seen some of your stuff with the artist taxi driver. When your hunger strike... I am hunger strike, yeah, that was good. How was your hunger strike? It I never thought I'd end it. It was an absolute nightmare. <laughs> it was like, the guy that did it before me was like the, the lawyer uh, for Sh- Sheikh Rema, and he's in his 50s, and uh, then it was a lady who's in her 70s took over from me, and they both sort of just said, oh, you know, it was, it was no problem and stuff, whereas I was walking about this hotel like The Shining, like just... <laughs> Absolutely gibbering. I was actually, for most of it, I was in uh, Stratford and Avon. I was going to see Shakespeare. And you know how middle class English people just can deal with anything? It doesn't matter what it is, they can deal with it. Do you know what I mean? So people just see you at the corner, I just like convulsing in a corner, and they would just be like, oh, he's probably on a hunger strike so, or something. <laughs> so how long were you on hunger strike? It was strike? only a week. And that was part of the thing, was I meant to do a week and then write about it, you know, try and dr- draw some attention to the plight of these guys in Guantanamo and, and, and Sheikh Raymond in particular. But I actually found that because I'd found it so difficult, I couldn't write about it because it was like, you get a tiny taste of what these guys are going through. But the big thing you get is you can't relate to it, that what's happening to them is actually so horrendous that you, you, you can't join in as a human being, even by just something as simple as denying yourself food for a week, you can't. Step yeah. in there, you know what I mean? That was that was kind of sad. I feel a bit guilty that I text you for a barbecue. Thought it would be a joke. I never realised the deep moral implication, of the place you were in at the time. I apologise. So your politics, and obviously we've got the referendum mm-hmm. vote next year, Scottish independence. Yeah, well, it's weird. Been... It's weird for me just being back, you know, because I've been back for a few years now, having lived in England for a bit and stuff, and just getting back into that whole negativity Scottish <laughs> mindset <laughs> just I, I, I kind of romanticise about Scotland being this foreign country we, we could get our own plug sockets and... <laughs> <laughs> no a big like seven pronger big ugly <laughs> and that kick starts the economy anybody visiting you need to buy your plug sockets mate <laughs> it's a British plug socket I think even just the vote will be exciting. Scottish people filling in official forms while still having their own belt and shoelaces. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the campaign's just been really lily livered. I think the big problem in Scotland is you have a culture, a vibrant Scottish culture, right? You don't hear any of that in the campaign. The campaign, it's always like, you know what I mean? Uh, Alan Cumming and, you know, it's Alex Salmond and it's all these awful people who actually hate Scottish culture. <laughs> I did an interview once with one of the Scottish broadsheets and I was going, you know, this thing about the Scottish middle class is they hate Scottish people and they don't like, you know, they don't like Irvin Welsh, they don't like Billy Conley, they don't like James Kelly, they don't like anything. And she was going, oh, that's so true. And I was going, well, why don't you, why don't you put that in the interview? And she's going, oh, I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I also think, I also think, you know, we've got a country covered in mushrooms in a year to think about this. <laughs> thing of Scottish culture, you know the culture people at like Salmon try and make, do you know what I mean? Which is like sort of a corporate culture and, and, and what, they, what they have is that kind of, do you know when you see a, a grotty old bar that's been changed into a kind of style pub and the people in the pub are still sort of old dossers because <laughs> they're sort of tied to that piece of ground you know, like a ghost would be I think that's kind of what Scotland is, do you know what I mean? We've got this framework gets thrown up around us, it's nothing to do with us, and our culture's actually really vibrant and, and something that we should try and project, get so away from should, these people. Uh, get our own royal family as well. Just get the phone book out, pick a house at random, that's um, <laughs> them. The McGlashan family, that's the royal family. 24 stroke to Kinfon's Drive, that's what I, I know they live in a flat, but it's the royal family. 
I I don't think we could stand that for anybody to you know, Scotland's too negative for that. I think we'd we'd end up with something that was like a national lottery where the person with the winning ticket was someone you got to go round and beat to death. <laughs> and you're just sitting there hoping it's an address near you and then <laughs> descending on them like zombies, man. But it's just a pity that we've, we've got such a kind of insipid uh, campaign. But then that's life, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're led by the least among us. You know, you're never going to find people who are, who are at the top in this kind of framework of society who are any good. It's salmon as well. I reckon at the yeah. end of it, he's just going to have a meltdown when it's all going to come out that you get a knockback for an English girl on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> when he was 15 and that's what's been fueling the whole campaign. It's going to break Claudia. So, anything else you want to talk about? <laughs> Anybody got a question? And I'll just rephrase it as mine. <laughs> How about you, sir? What's your name? Uh, Ian. Ian. Any questions, Ian? <laughs> Would I go back to teaching? Hold oh, on, hold on. Let me get the link in. Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> Be- before stand-up, you were a teacher. But- would that be something you would consider going back to? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just think it's a stupid question. <laughs> it's, it's, why, would, why would you ask that on the back of there's nothing interesting about teaching. Much as I've tried to mine it for comedy in the past. There's Cheers nothing. for that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Who's the biggest prick you've met? Uh, I don't know. I've, all, I've been quite lucky in that I've almost met no real wallopers. <laughs> oh. I actually find like you don't meet many kind of people you don't like in show business because actually they're all so wrapped up in themselves that it's kind of hard for them to even come out to annoy you. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. they're generally Googling their own name. That's why I'm going into grime. Why shouldn't I be a great grime MC? <laughs> <laughs> so, Frankie, good luck with the grime scene. <laughs> and it's been a pleasure talking to you. Ladies and gentlemen, please give up for Frankie Boyle. Writing jokes, uh, which I find just really distressing. <laughs> There's a... A short story I used to teach when I was an English teacher. What's it called? Exam day. And it's all about a wee boy who's uh, asking his dad questions over breakfast. He's going, how, how near's the sun? And his dad's a thousand miles away. Shut up. Right? And, well, why is grass green? Shut up, son. I've told you before. No questions and all that. And you just think he's a really horrible dad. And then the boy goes off to school or whatever. And then at the end, he gets a phone call from some authority going, yeah, your son scored too high in the IQ test. We've had to kill him. You're going to have to turn up and pick up the body, right? And you realise it's actually set in the future and that the, the dad was actually trying to stop his kid from being too intelligent, do you know what I mean? Because of what he knows. And that, that is kind of how I feel every time my son tells me a joke. <laughs> just, just don't go down that road, son. Oh, you sound... Uh, you can tell you're a good dad, of course. <laughs> that's, that's what you're looking for. You know? <laughs> My dad was the exact same. <laughs> I just think it's great we've put you on near the end <laughs> of the chain because there's every chance the series could get pulled. Yeah. <laughs> Bible John, and now how you don't love your kids. And, uh, you know, preparing them for the post-apocalypse. <laughs> the thing. Do you, is that something you think about, like doomsday? Not doomsday. You give that so impression much. that you think about something horrific is going to happen at any minute. No, it's not just me, it's science. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a lot of things there where people are very negative about things like you're like, well, you know, the scientists are saying the world's going to end quite soon. It's not the guys with placards anymore, it's like climate change experts going, uh, you're all going to drown. I was, on, uh, I was on Richard and Judy one time, right? And this is the most. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hello, thank you and welcome to Chain Reaction. I'm Kevin Bridges and today I'm interviewing a man who is a friend of mine. I'm a huge fan of his work. It's Frankie Boyle. Cheers, Kevin. (laughs) Uh, Frankie, I've never actually interviewed anybody before. I feel like a HND journalism student (laughs) and I need to do this for my module. (laughs) 
Ask me anything, Kevin. Ask you anything at all. Um, do you ever listen to the shipping forecast? <laughs> yeah, I always find that sort of sublimely hypnotic. You see, I, I bought a boat this year. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I listened to the shipping forecast, try to get into the sort of maritime lifestyle, and uh, it never made any sense. <laughs> but you've, you've been on the boat. I have been on the boat. It was a very yeah. cold day, and uh, you, you drove it like a maniac from Claybank <laughs> around Loch Lomond. Well, what actually happened that day was we were actually mates off stage, <laughs> yeah. Frankie and I. And uh, I'd said to him, Do you fancy going on a cycle? Yep. We'll weave for Glasgow and cycle to Loch Lomond. And uh, Partick is the nearest area to where me and Frankie live. And uh, Partick is where you ditched the idea of yeah. the cycle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I cycled and you get a taxi. I, I made it to Dumbarton Road from my house. And then you said, well, I'll join, I'll join up with you in like 40 minutes up at Barlock. And then you appeared like three hours later, having been stuck in a housing estate. And you were in a, a shop having a rolling egg? I had two lunches. And we, uh, it, was, it was one of the least successful days of exercise of all time. <laughs> but you, you expressed a bit of concern, though. You text me saying, are you... This is mental illness, essentially. It's probably somebody, <laughs> somebody you used to look after who now hangs the Frankie Boyle. <laughs> I might be him. <laughs> it was quite an interesting job, though, because it was like, you start to wonder about, you know, where the line is and where we tell people things, you know what I mean? So I had a woman, a client, who was a, a lovely woman, right, but she, she had a real, like, weight problem, and she was, like, um, she was a pretty ill person, and uh, part of her care plan was she liked to get up and eat in the night, right? Like, in the dead of night, right? So you'd sort of come in when you're doing a sleepover and you'd find this, you know, pretty heavy woman in a wheelchair and she'd be, like, eating a block of cheese out of the, out of the fridge, right? And you go, oh, this is obviously terrible. And we'd sit down and have a meeting about it and that. And then eventually you sort of start thinking, I eat cheese out of the fridge. <laughs> Sometimes in the dead of night, do you know what I mean? So you're definitely retired. You're, that's, you're well, done with stand-up. I'm done with stand-up. I'm sort of moving more into hip-hop now. <laughs> I'm moving on to the kind of London grime scene, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's partly just having little kids as well. You can't really be away for like, you know, I used to go away for like six months and stuff, and now they're a wee bit older. How about the kids? They're uh, very jolly, very funny. My daughter's got into uh, Faulty Towers recently uh, and she really really loves it but also there's part of that thing where you start to notice oh she's starting to notice I'm a bit like Basil <laughs> I'm, a bit like, I'm a bit like you know your kids get to age sort of 9, 10 when they start to go this guy doesn't really know what he's talking about <laughs> doubt starts to creep in I'm just, the other one's 6 I'm quite enjoying still being you know seen as a, a, a figure of authority and falls funny your son yeah he started alright because obviously it was a lot longer yeah. than planned I've found that I met you when I was maybe 19 in here. Mm -hmm. We were on Shared the Bill together right. for the first time. And I'm watching your set and I'm just going, that guy must be brutal. <laughs> but you're actually a lovely guy. You've got a, one of my favourite birthday presents of all time is from yourself. You bought me a Skeletric set. Aye, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. For your 21st? For my 21st. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've still got it. All right. Does and it I, work? Um, it works. It's still there. I've got it, so... Maybe we'll hook up for a game and I you can abandon it <laughs> at the first turn. <laughs> Drop my egg roll on the bend. <laughs> yeah, I, I hang about with you in the streets and I'm thinking maybe you're just going to start laughing at disabled people. <laughs> <in the face. laughs> Walking up and booting guide dogs right in the muzzle. And... You're a good guy. I know. I, I think there's a thing in comedy, isn't there? We're certainly in the last ten years or so. People kind of don't really understand the whole idea of what the persona is you adopt on stage. And what I, I had a review one time, and the guy's going, uh, "I could accept what he's saying if he was a character act." And he's saying, "Well, where's that intellectually? I'd feel better about this if you were wearing a hat." <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really bear up to the examination. Would you, you ever consider take, that? Hmm? Would you ever just, consider just wearing a hat? <laughs> <laughs> hat off. <laughs> It's me. Uh, I think things would be a lot easier. Things are a lot easier if you just go, oh yeah, I'm a pub landlord or a preacher or a whatever. Do you know what I mean? People seem to be able to deal with that a bit better than I'm a comedian. But, you know, that's kind of their problem. When we started, you sort of took me under your wing. Yeah. And I'd always ask you advice. And it got to the stage I thought, I don't know if he's the guy I should ask advice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fan of your work. 
And I, I checked up on what you're up to today, uh -huh. and you're feuding with X Factor winner James Arthur. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever just wake up in the mood for a nice, quiet day? <laughs> Zero uh, scandal. Just I think it's partly been retired from the stand up as well, man. The other day, we're driving back from uh, Radio Clyde, and my pal goes, Well, that's where one of the Bible John murders was. <laughs> so I said, Oh, let's go up and have a look, right? So we drive up there. And I'm going, oh, this was a long way to come in a taxi for Bible John, right? <laughs> let's let's drive up to the Barrowlands and see see what was going So I start theorising, maybe he lived out sort of Scotch thing, Clyde Bankway, right? And I said to my pal, I said, we should get a map and put the, the murders on it. And then you do, any point where you, you're starting to get a map and put murder sites on it <laughs> is a point where you need to get a job. Yeah, you've actually got a good backstory before comedy. You worked... In a psychiatric hospital. See, that's sh that show business, though, man. We start thinking of backstories rather than lives. <laughs> I've got a great good backstory, you know what I mean? Uh, I worked for a year in a, a mental hospital, and uh, that was a right laugh. Uh, still have a good laugh at that. No, it was um, it was it was a really great job, but uh, it was that thing as well where you sort of um, you saw the start of this. You know how prevalent kind of TV and fame kind of affects people now, because like. Uh, in the old days, you ever read about it was like Napoleon uh, was who people thought they were in, a, in an insane asylum. And then it was Hitler. So you see the people I worked with who were like in their 60s, mid-60s, it was always Hitler, Hitler's after me. The Germans are travelling through time and all that stuff, right? It was always about Hitler. And nowadays, it's always about TV. So if you see young people now who are schizophrenic and stuff, it's always like, oh, the TV's telling me to do this, or I'm in this show, or I'm, a, I'm on TV, or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And that's right. what I think is weird about... Uh, actually doing TV is, is you actually are doing that so you're in the uh, you're in the same place